my name's Jen Wood. Welcome to today's episode of Coffee Break. And today I'm here at the Tilstra Museum in Bankstown with two gentlemen who are very passionate about... The whole concept of our museum, which includes uh, uh, equipment dating back to 1854. And um, we have about... 14 regular volunteers who come in weekly and um, do what they've got to do. Mm -hmm. We have 98,000 negatives being scanned by our ex-Telstra photographer. We have a couple of engineers who are going through documentation with, with original, some original documents, most of them are copies, mm -hmm. dating back to the 1800s. And lots of very old documentation. We have a theatre at, and we show old vintage telecommunication movies and uh, we demonstrate the Morse code and uh, at the moment we're cataloguing which is a, a major project and uh, everybody is very keen on what they're doing. They love it. Yeah and I can tell that you love coming and being a volunteer here because you get to play with all the toys. <laughs> You've got so many toys. Yes well it's we all have our own little 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 hobby amongst us, but um, most of us um, we're all prepared to sit down and mm -hmm. take people through tours. We usually have Provost clubs, senior citizens, school groups who come through of a Tuesday over Wednesday, and uh, there's no, there's no charge a donation if you so desire. But apart from that, we just want to show what we have. I know and how it used to be. I know it's a fabulous collection, and a lot of young people wouldn't understand what some of these things are. Now, you've taken us on a tour. Here are some of the more obscure things about telecommunications. These are the first two phones. Shame I can't get into them to move them, separate them. These are the first two phones ever used in New South Wales, used for experimental purposes from uh, Sydney GPO to La Perouse in 1878. Very, uh, very rare phones. One, only one at each end. You would speak and then you would listen, speak and listen. Uh, that would be the phone. No, it's a doorbell, I think. It's a doorbell, Les, can you get it? Okay, here we have a step-by-step -step exchange. Automatic exchange came into, into being in 1912 in Geelong. Um, in Sydney, 1914 was Newtown. And this is how it actually worked. If you can picture me, I've just lifted a receiver and I've grabbed the first selector. So I'm going to dial this particular number, 3003211. I've held the first selector with the first digit, gone to the second, which is a zero, zero, three, two. The last unit does two separate movements. It always works. And of course, if you can picture being in, a, in an exchange at 9.30 Monday morning peak hour, this is one call being hung up. Cop that young Harry. A joke. This is for making long distance calls. This is a diagram of how your, your house is actually connected to the local telephone exchange through underground cables in the street and of course aerials as well. I'm about to show you how manual calls were plugged through before the automatic system came into force. Uh, if a subscriber would ring, a shutter would drop, you'd plug into that particular number, ask the subscriber what number they wanted and they'd say oh, 5 6 please, so plug into 5 6 and course you'd ring. And when they finished, they would firstly turn the handle and number eight would drop, which is pair cord number eight. You'd go across, have you finished? If so, and you would charge the subscriber in this little docket by writing 4-4. Four, four. And uh, as a telegram boy in South Crafton, 
uh, we had to operate the switchboards in the country towns after hours because girls weren't allowed to work after 11 o'clock at night. So uh, we had to do all these tallies and double check and whatnot. Unfortunately, when the girls were leaving, they'd thump the board and all the shutters would drop and I'd have to go across one at a time to check which was a genuine call. So when, every time the girls were leaving, I'd go, go home girls, go home. This basically was a female's job, and, uh, but only because they weren't allowed at the time to work after 11 o'clock at night. Um, the telegram boys would have to do the duty. Some exchanges were sleeping, but um, my particular one wasn't. It was a sit up all night job, but good job. This is the intrastate exchange on the fourth floor of GPO, 1956, of hive of activity and uh, the telegraph branch was, so it was out a couple of doors through where we had 400 men in one particular room doing the Morse code and teleprinters and whatnot for telegrams. But uh, it was a very busy place, as you can see. Nineteen fifty-six. Oh, you may notice the time: eleven three, eleven eight, eleven ten. 1116, uh, a series of four photographs taken and merged together to get one broad, sheet, broad shot. But above we have the GPO in, a, in 1870. This is Martin Place through here. And that's Martin Place and George Street. Uh, they built the building right up, up to the existing, of course there's no Martin Place. This section was demolished and they built a galvanised iron building up to about here and gave a narrow opening through for the Martin Place. Uh, the next one shows they demolished the whole lot, um, built half the GPO and did the other half and the clock went on. That's the completed job. Here, that's, they do it in two sections. That's the first half, George Street, Martin Place. Um, they completed it, the clock went on and in 1942, the clock was removed during the war, as it would have been a prime time. There's a sign that was on the colonnade of the GPO Martin Place. Uh, it wasn't an air raid shelter, according to the sign. These were ty typical phones that would have been in use during the war. Uh, 300s and 400 Bakelites. Very heavy phone. It's good because the kids couldn't hang on to and wouldn't talk too long. They were, they were too heavy. This old clock was restored quite a few years ago, but it, it's originally in 1870s, or prior to 1870, because uh, in 1870 they installed a different mechanism. This is weight driven. You have to wind the weight up so it would pull the, and keeps pretty good time. It's a beautiful old clock. These are video phones, as you can see. Um, very expensive at the time, so uh, right. mobile phones. <coughs> Just a few mobile phones, very lightweight pocket models, pocket version. What year, Brian? 87, 1987. And this is a car phone, very, very bulky, as you can see. That'll be on a console inside your car, and the rest will be in the boot. Okay, now Brian, you've spent your entire life working in the field of telecommunications, mm, haven't you? Not really. Um, I gave it all away when I couldn't find anything else that I wanted to do within the, in this, oh, okay. in the PMG telecom. But I got back involved in 1989 trying to locate some old film footage of our, the Telegraph branch, which we're part of. 
I uh, started going through the film with another fellow. Um, there was no museum in those days, just a collection. And uh, I started, if I'm going to look through this film, I might as well catalogue it and describe what's in it and um, the running time, etc. I haven't finished yet. And that was 1989. So busy. There's so much to do. We've now come a long way. We're now accepted as the Telstra Museum. We, um, beforehand, we weren't number one on their priority, but now we are so, and uh, we're very happy about that. Mm. We've achieved a lot over the years. Um, I received an Order of Australia Medal for um, involvement in moving the location from here to from Ashfield to here, and uh, that was in 2007, mm. which was very nice to receive. Mm. And, um, and of course, Les has uh, always been involved as secretary of the Morse Code in fraternity, which I'll let Les go into detail. Okay. Well, thanks for letting me come here today and showing me all your toys. You it's haven't been... seen all the toys. You've only seen a little bit of all the toys. <laughs> Okay, well, if anyone would like to come and visit the Telstra Museum, where are you? 12 Kitchener Parade, Bankstown, mm -hmm. and uh, we're right beside the RSL, so uh, liquid lunches. <laughs> My name's Jan Wood and you're watching Coffee Break and today I'm here at the Telstra Museum in Bankstown and Les is one of the volunteers here. He specialises in telegraphy. Mainly that, yes. Uh, the, the Morse code, the teleprinters, uh, telex, mainly all that, yeah. But uh, I'm actually Secretary Treasurer of the Morse Codians Fraternity, which we've got 600 members throughout Australia. And uh, every year in, uh, in October we have a reunion mm -hmm. and there's usually between 100 and 130, 130 people attend that. Most of the procedure is done in Morse code, which is a unique sort of a thing. And uh, we have a great time. And uh, it's, our numbers are dwindling because we're all getting old now. Yeah. And uh, actually Brian and I were the last class ever trained in Morse code in New South Wales. And it was in 1956. So mm -hmm. it's, what, 50, 57 years ago. So the ranks are getting a bit thin. So. Yeah, I remember as a little girl, the um, postmistress at East Balmain um, Post Office, she was a telegrapher. Yeah. The, tel the, the, the message had come in and out. she'd type it out and then they'd send it off with the telegraph boy. That's right. Well, that's what, that's what Brian and I were, telegraph boys. <laughs> they were called the junior postal officer, but they were actually telegram boys. Yeah, so, yeah, that was the same thing. Where, where, where we worked, they used to come in by Morse code. The, the postal clerk would type them out. Mm -hmm. And we 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 put them in a book them up, put them on an envelope, and take them out and deliver them. So yeah. how old were you when you were a telegraph boy? Fifteen, fifteen. Yeah, I was at a place called Westgate, which is on Parramatta Road between Annandale and Leichhardt, and that's where I started. The twentieth of April, nineteen fifty-four, I started there. Yeah. And there's a page in this book for the naughty, the naughty telegraph boys. There were, there is too. Yeah, it was about what year was that, Brian? Nineteen oh eight. 1908. Yeah, if you'd made a mistake, you went in this Miss Medema book, all right? And there's a fellow in there, his name was Cardinal Gilroy. <laughs> he wasn't Cardinal Gilroy at the time, of course, but uh, he finished up being he, he finished up being a telegraphist himself. Uh -huh. And he went through, then he uh, became the, went into the priesthood and became a cardinal. Yeah, Cardinal Gilroy. Morse code is your passion, isn't it? And you love sending telegrams, and you're. You work here and you're very um, clued up on the history of the telegraph machine. So you're going to take us on a little tour, aren't you? Well, I can tell you a couple of things first of all. You've all heard of Reuters, Reuters News Agency. Yep. Now, Reuters actually started these back in 1840. He started this service and his service was by carrier pigeon. It was between Germany and, and, and Belgium and here, Brussels and and. Uh, anyhow, 
He said it was a carrier pigeon. He found he could beat the mail by three hours. Now, all the business people used to pay him well to get information three hours ahead of the rest of the country. So he could go down the stock exchange and buy stuff three hours ahead of everyone else. So that's how he first started his service, about 1840. So Reuters has been going a long time. So he would have progressed from the carrier pigeon to the telegraph machine. Uh, yeah, probably, yeah. yeah um, but 1840, it like, wasn't, wasn't in, the first message wasn't sent until 1844 and took years for it to actually spread throughout the field, through Europe. And that's, uh, would have been 1850 before and it was over in Europe were actually working so they could send messages through it. So, Les, one of the best books that I've ever read mm-hmm. was about... It was written by Alice Todd, yeah. and she retraced the journey of her forebear when they laid down the telegraph poles from, was it Adelaide to...? It was Port Augusta to Darwin, yeah. It was it started through the centre of Australia. They laid actually 36,000 poles, 36,000. I've read that book. It was a very good book. It, it keeps... Uh, they, they're doing a four-wheel drive tour, mm. And it keeps switching back to the past and the present, the past and the present, yeah. Yeah, that was written by his great-granddaughter or something like that, it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a good book. There's a few other books too. There's another one by Peter Taylor, An End of Silence. And I think that was The Singing Line. Is that The Singing Line, that one you read? And, uh, and the other one's uh, Alice on the Line. Yeah, Alice, the, on the line. Alice on the Line. that was the one you read, I think. There's another one, The Singing Line, which is written by uh, one of the... Um, the station masters at Alice Springs, his daughter Bradfield, was Bradshaw, Bradshaw, Bradshaw. It was his daughter actually wrote the, the story of a trip from Adelaide right up to Alice Springs and the, the hardships they had to put up with and everything. Yeah. It, quite an extraordinary achievement. I mean, in Europe, when they put down the telegraph poles, the countries are small, but the distances in Australia, it's just... Well, it's three thousand kilometres. Three thousand kilometres. They laid it in just just uh, ne- just on two, nearly two years. So, and uh, it, it's, it's a marvellous achievement. Marvellous achievement. And what it did for the rest of the for uh, communications in this country was astounding. Yeah. Yeah. But they did have problems, like the termites were very good at eating the wooden telegraph poles yeah. and also the Aboriginal people discovered that what telegraph wire was uh, useful for many, many things. So quite often bits yeah. of the wire would go missing. Yeah, well, the poles, when they first put the poles through, immediately they had to go back and replace them all with steel poles. And some of the poles were actually being held up by the wire between the other two poles. <laughs> the, the whole bottom part was gone. Uh, so they replaced them immediately with steel poles, Oppenheimer poles. Yeah, and uh, the Aborigines they used to actually break the insulators. They break the insulators to get the, the, for their spearheads, but they overcame that problem. But what they did, they broke up old insulators and put them around the base of the pole. And the Aborigines only took what they needed. They didn't waste anything. The Aborigines. So if if there was air for them, they didn't worry about breaking the one upstairs. So they solved that problem. Work smarter, not harder. Hello, my name's Les and we're at the, the museum here. I'm just going to show you a few things, uh, especially the telegraph side of things and how the Morse code operated and and uh, what, who it was invented by, etc. So, yeah, so if I can just move over here. The Morse code was in, invented by a man named Samuel Morse and his first invention was a tape machine. It was it wound up and it dragged the tape through. When the tape came through, it marked dots and dashes on the tape. The telegraphers would get the tape and read that tape, converting the dots and dashes into letters and words. Just to come through as such, this one actually still works. So it's pulling the tape through, and the dots and dashes come out on it, etc. The telegraphers get the tape and transmit, translate the dots and dashes. But when it was coming through, it was making that sound. And they realised after a few years, they could actually read the sound, which was much quicker. So instead of having to look at the tape, they could just write it down straight away. So that's what they did after about, about 1890. They did away with the, the tape machine and just read it by sound like we do today. Right. Uh, he invented it in, in 1850, 1844, the first message was sent, Washington to Baltimore. And uh, that was the words were, what have God wrought? That were the first words that were sent through, what have God wrought? Um, 
Within about 10 years, there was about 52,000 kilometres of wire right through America. I'll give you an example of what a difference Morse code made in the world. In 1841, the President of the United States, William Harrison, died. And the news of his death took 110 days to reach California. So the President was dead for over three months. West Coast of America didn't know. In 1865, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. That news was flashed by telegraph all over America in minutes. So that's what a difference Morse code made. A huge difference. Okay, around about 19, the early 20s, uh, there was a thing called the Murray Multiplex. That was a teleprinter network, but that was replaced by the English version, the teleprinter Creed. This is a Creed teleprinter. It was an English machine. It's very noisy, so it won't start because you won't, you, it'll come over the top of the voice. But that's the English Creed machine. They were gradually replacing the Morse code. Finally, in 1962, there was a system came, well, it came in actually 1959, was finalised in 1962, it was a system called TRESS. And that was an automatic switching system that switched each, to each post office had its own code. And the, the TRESS system, you put, it, put the, the code at the start of the tape, the tape would come up, switch to that, to, to that post office. So everyone had their own code and it was a system that worked very well, it was a very good system. That was the t English teleprinter. There was also the American one, which was the teletype. The Americans developed that during the war, during the Second World War. And it was also a very good, you want to hear it going. Okay. You'd like it to see that, wouldn't you? So that was the TRESS system that actually replaced the Morse code and, uh, in 1962, as I told you earlier. This is a photo of the switching section in the, in the GPR on the same floor. There was a special room for where every, every telegram that was sent came through and was switched through for one of these machines from outside, out in the main operating room. And they, each one of these was connected somewhere in Australia, all over Australia. Yeah. They went into state, then they switched into state as well. There was a supervisor on each one of these rows, working each, each, each row. The last Morse code messages in, in New South Wales were sent on the 13th of December 1962. It was sent by a man named Harry Winchester. Harry retired that day and they gave Harry the honour of sending the last message. It was sent from Sydney to Bombala which is down, down south, and each, every, the newspapers were there, the yeah, television, the whole lot, everyone gathered around to watch it, the very special occasion. There's two young fellas down here you might see, sitting down there. Young at the time. Young at the time. That's Brian, and the other one's me. So we were both, we're, what, I was 24 and he was 25 then, so we we're, were both just married, we we're both just come back from our honeymoon. So. 50 years ago, yeah. <laughs> Nearly 51 now. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of memories there. All the fellows in that photo, we can name about 90% of them. So, um, very special occasion. It's a, it's a very good photo for us to, to keep for our, our history.